that you're here. You made it. A bunch of you made it. This is a this is a different room than it was last week. We're so glad that you're here with us. Would you please stand and join us in singing our first song?
friends. Amen, indeed. You can be seated. Tech team, can they hear me okay with this? Now that I've adjusted it. Y'all hear me okay? Awesome. My friends, it is so good to have you all joining us in worship this morning. It is good to welcome the Holy Spirit into this place. Thank you for helping us do that so far today. Friends, I'm glad you are here. Whether you are with us online or in person, it is a wonderful, good, and beautiful day when the Lord God gathers us all together as a family of faith to be together, to worship together, to fellowship with one another, and just be at home with one another. I'd like to invite you, if you haven't already, to let us know that you are here today. For those in uh, the upper room, there should be uh, friendship pads, either maybe in the pocket of the chair in front of you or maybe at the end of the row. You might have to search around for them. If for any chance you don't see them, please let us know, since we've just kind of come back to the upper room space. It could be that they haven't been put out yet. And for those of you who are online, there is a friendship pad located in the description of this video. So we can know that you are here with us as well. I am uh, so glad to be joined in this worship space today with so many people. Of course, we have Chris and Kylie who are here to lead us in worship and praise. We have a moment for mission later in the service with Doug Key, who will be coming up to be sharing a little bit about our partners with Malawi. And of course, we have our uh, deacons, ushers, our sound team, and those deacons and elders who are serving communion today. Because friends, today is a communion Sunday. And it's a special communion Sunday, in fact, because since today is the first Sunday of, uh, of October, it is World Communion Sunday. And it's just a day where we take special time to reflect and acknowledge that all around the world, on Sunday and on a variety of other days as well, Christians gather at God's table, gather at the table together, united by the Spirit, to remember all that God has first done for us. So we will get to enjoy communion in just a little bit. And again, a note for our friends at home, this would be a good time to pause and gather your own communion elements, uh, if you haven't already, so that you can join us in just a little bit. I do have just a couple of announcements to share with you all before we continue with our worship service today. First, I want to draw your attention to page six of your bulletin. On it, you will see an announcement um, about the Red Cross blood drive that our deacons host with the, with the Red Cross here on, uh, at our church on October 13th. So I want to name that all of the blood that is collected from this blood drive first goes to needs here in Michigan. But we did receive a call earlier this week that stated that if we like meet that goal and surpass it, all additional blood collected will be sent down to Florida to help with hurricane relief efforts that are there. So always a worthy cause to sign up for, but just all the more reason to consider joining us on October 13th. You can sign up online for that blood drive. I also would like to share about our fall new member class that is starting, that's happening this month. We have two new member classes, two options for you. The first is on Sunday, October 16th, and that will be an in-person class. And the second will be on Sunday, October 23rd, and that will be an online Zoom class. So the content for both classes will be the same regardless of which one you go to, but we just wanted to offer it in two different formats. So if you ever wonder, like, what does it mean to be Presbyterian or to join First Presbyterian Church of Plymouth, I invite you to come out on one of those two days and talk with our uh, new members team and the pastors that are there so that we can just help explain a little bit more about what membership is like here. And finally, just to keep you all kind of informed on things happening, just so you know, next Sunday, which is the October 9th, believe it or not, October 9th, the Sanctuary Service is holding their annual gospel concert downstairs, the 930 service. So, of course, I just encourage you all to go downstairs to the gospel concert and then join us up here at 1115. Double worship. Yeah, I see some excited head nods on that. <laughs> But again, just that you all are aware of what is going on in that service as well. Friends, again, certainly this is the day that the Lord has made, and I invite you now to join me in prayer as we come before our God today. Gracious and loving God, you have made an everlasting home with us 
by the power of your spirit. As a sign of your love and hospitality, you have set a table before us, welcoming all of your children to come, eat, drink, and enjoy. However, sometimes we resist your grace and deny your invitation to invest fully in this gathered community of faith. We struggle with vulnerability and judge those who sit beside us. As we gather here now for worship, we repent of these sins and ask you to forgive us of all of our unrighteousness. May all of us gathered online and in person encounter your Son and be transformed by your Spirit. In the presence of your goodness and mercy, renew our hearts so that we might serve you with confidence and joy. Amen. Amen. Friends, let us extend God's peace to one another now. It is so convenient for me that you're still standing. <laughs> oh, I love. I get. I don't get these laughs at home. <laughs> um, this week, when we were prepping for today's service, uh, today's theme, in addition to being World Communion Sunday, is about the Holy Spirit. And um, I, I heard from from our excellent pastors that the word. Spirit roughly translates to the word breath. And we're going to sing a song in which the main line is, it's your breath in our lungs. I thought that would just be a really powerful thing to sing today as we get ready for the message. Hope you'll join in singing, uh, Greater You, Lord. You give hope, you 
out your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing Friends, today we are carrying on in our sermon series on the dwelling place of God. And as we have looked at the tabernacle and we've looked at the temple today and we've looked at the Savior, today we turn our attention to the Spirit. And perhaps the most familiar story of the Holy Spirit is found in Acts chapter 2, which is the story of Pentecost. And so I invite you to listen for and hear Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it? that each of us hears them in our own native languages. Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Friends, we continue to ask ourselves this question, what does it mean, as we consider the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as a evidence, as further evidence, rather, of the way that the Spirit does work in our lives, calling us to respond to need. I'm going to invite Doug Key forward at this time to share with us our moment of mission, which comes from the National International Mission Committee. Thanks, Emily. Good morning. 
I bring greetings from our partner church in Malawi in Southern Africa, Kintera CCAP. Uh, for those of you who might be new here, uh, we've been in a congregational partnership, just our two churches together for uh, 12 years, going on 13 years this year, and uh, truly have become brothers and sisters in Christ. We have shared many things. They visited here. We visited there. Lots of, lots of things have gone on to bring our communities closer together. Uh, Malawi is a wonderful place, a beautiful place, but it's a very poor country. Uh, I've heard it described, sadly, as the poorest peaceful nation on the planet. Uh, and they're having a tough year this year because of bad rains uh, last, last year. You guys have that picture of the lady with the bag of meat. There we go. So people there are subsistence farmers, by and large. So what they raise, they eat and sell what little they may have left over. And this year there were low, low rains, late rains, so the harvest has been bad. Uh, there is food, but not enough for everyone. So the church over there has appealed to us to see if we could possibly help them this year. Uh, this has happened a couple times over the, over the seasons we've been partners. And it, we have a good process set up to you know, logistically do this. If we can raise some funds, we can wire it right over to Malawi. Uh, the church and our partnership coordinator can manage the purchase of corn, which is kind of the basic food stuff used right in the local markets. They know who the people are who are the most needy in the congregation, and literally within a week or two, people can have food. So it's not a, not a big bureaucratic process. It's very straightforward, which is the beauty of having a partnership like we do. So this year, our goal is to raise enough funds for 200 bags of maize, 50 kilogram, 110 pound bags, which are enough to feed a family for a month. And they each cost right now in the market, they're about $15 each. So it's about a $3,000 goal that uh, our National International Mission Committee is trying to achieve. Uh, Elsa Blunt has a table set up downstairs in the narthex to uh, uh, take collections if you're, if you're moved to help us with that. And also there's a number of pictures from an earlier distribution of food that we did years ago. And part of what amazed me, and I'll, I'll end on this, is we are, we are generous. We help our friends when they're in need, and they, they are so grateful for that. They would help us when we're in need, but I've also seen with my own eyes uh, a person like this woman in the picture being given a big old bag of maize, and that's for her family, and that's what it's been designated for. She will go down the road away, drop that bag down on the ground, cut it open, and share it with her neighbor. So they know they need to help each other, even if they're in a hard place. They, they, that's how they live. That's the spirit, and that to me is the church at work. So I appreciate all that you guys have done in the past and uh, would ask you prayerfully consider helping us with this appeal for our, our friends in Malawi. Thanks. And now at this time in the service, it is time for us with gratitude to respond to God's abundant blessings of each of us with our gifts of tithes and offerings.
things. Let us pray. Ever-present God, we praise you for your mercy and your steadfast faithfulness, for your goodness that has created us, your grace that has sustained us, your love that has redeemed us, and your spirit that now remains with us. We long to follow the selflessness of your ways, to be faithful givers, modeling ourselves after you, the one who has given everything first to us. May your spirit of abundance, which gives more than we can ask or imagine, bless these gifts for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, our second scripture reading for today comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Let us hear now God's word to each of us. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we might hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, you may or may not have noticed that I wasn't here last week. <laughs> I wasn't in Plymouth. I wasn't even in Metro Detroit or even Michigan for that matter. Last Sunday, I found myself in Little Rock, Arkansas. Has anyone else been to Little Rock before? Anyone in the room? I see a, a couple of hands, but I'm going to stress only a couple of hands. <laughs> So I was in Little Rock last week in order to attend a week-long Presbyterian conference uh, held by our denomination that is intended for new and newly ordained ministers of the church. So this conference is called Credo. So at Credo, both myself and 19 other ministers gathered, who all of them, or almost all of them, were like me and had only ever done ministry, at least in an ordained context, during COVID. <laughs> Like almost all of us, minus about three, were ordained, graduated seminary during COVID. And so this time together was intended to be a refreshing space, a place where we could talk about what does self-care look like in the church? What does it mean to care for ourselves as ministers so that we can be doing this work we feel called to for hopefully 20, 30, or who knows, more years? We also was a great opportunity to, again, to gather with other young in ministry ministers and say, what's happening at your church? What are the joys that need to be celebrated? Tell us about them. What are the hard things? What are the things that feel uniquely hard to you that you need to hear are not uniquely hard to you, but everyone in the church is facing something similar? And then also, of course, we spent time in worship discerning and dreaming about where is the Spirit of God at now? And where, of course, is the Spirit of God leading us next? It was a really wonderful time away, and I want to thank you all again for the gift you gave me in allowing me to go. And while we were there at this camp and conference center, the center itself was located um, on the shores of a very small lake, and kind of at the base of three small mountains. I call them small because I grew up with the Cascades. <laughs> and while we were there, we were encouraged to spend our time, our downtime, hiking in order we had some private space to reflect on all that we were learning. Well, one evening, as we were all settling down for dinner, one of my new Credo friends came in, and I have to admit, she looked not great. She looked very disheveled and a little disoriented, and as we were talking, she proceeded to tell me that she had been out hiking earlier that afternoon, but had gotten lost. 
what should have been a very casual, easy, like 30-minute stroll, I mean, she was wearing like flip-flops, <laughs> turned into an over three-hour wilderness excursion <laughs> after she missed one of the trail markers and just ended up kind of wandering in this wooded space. While trying to retrace her steps, she met a friendly hiker who, noticing her distress and clearly the fact she was lost, offered to help her find her way back to camp. This hiker stayed with my friend the entire way until again they arrived back at our camp. And upon waving goodbye, the helpful hiker smiled and remarked that she better get back out there in case there were any more lost souls that needed help finding home. <laughs> Friends, for the past several weeks, we have been tracing the story of how God has made a home amongst God's people and how God, in turn, invites us, every single one of us, to make a home with God as well. We started our journey with the tabernacle, a movable structure that could travel with the Hebrew people wherever it is that they went. God made God's presence known in that place through the pillar of cloud or fire that would hover over that space both day and night. Whenever the pillar of cloud or fire moved or came up from that place, it was a sign of the people to get ready, to move again, to trust that their Lord was now leading them in a new direction. Eventually, the people settled into their promised land, and once they were there, they desired to make a permanent home for God as well. And that's, of course, when they built the temple. Set on the highest hill overlooking the city of Jerusalem, the temple was intended to be a massive, ornate, beautiful, permanent structure where the gold and five fabrics, everything that was in it, was meant to point towards the glory and the graciousness, the power and the stronghold of God. Like the tabernacle, God confirmed God's presence in that place by having a cloud descend over that temple and filling it with the glory of the Lord. Both the tabernacle and the temple were markers of God's desire to be with God's people. But friends, as we learned, they were limited. Bound to a particular time and place and created to serve the needs of a particular people Questions arose once the temple was destroyed, gone forever, and the people were exiled into foreign lands. Additionally, both these structures still represented only a, still represented a partial separation, as the fullness of God's presence was also often reserved for the innermost rooms, where a majority of the people were forbidden from ever going into under risk of death. And so even with the tabernacle and the temple, these signs of God's presence, we are left with a question. How might God make a home with us where all of God might dwell always with all of God's people? Well, last week, Emily introduced us to a turning point. In John 1.14, we learn that God's word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The Greek word translated here as dwelling is the same Greek word that's translated to tabernacle. So in this passage, we learn that Jesus came to earth to tabernacle amongst us, to travel through life with us, just as that tabernacle traveled with the Hebrew people in the wilderness, to face the joys and challenges of each day together, to be with us fully, just as it was always intended just as it was designed and created to be like in the garden. In, G in Jesus, the presence of God was revealed to all, and the death, resurrection, and ascension of the one who was fully God and fully human ripped the veil, ripped the veil that once separated us from God. Because in Jesus, God was able to embrace the full meaning of what it means to tabernacle, what it means to dwell with us, to be with us fully forever. But friends, although it is in Christ alone that we encounter our creator and Lord face to face, this isn't the end of God's journey to create a home among us. G 
Jesus knew that he would only be with his people for a set period of time, physically at least, on earth. He knew that eventually he would ascend to the Father, as scripture tells us, back to heaven. So for a second time in this sermon series, we receive a gift from God. The first, as a reminder, was the temple, the place created for us to pray to and toward. And the second now is the Holy Spirit, a gift which, like the first, is given for our benefit and serves as a reminder that God is always present, that God is always listening, always watching, always with us. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus says that he will send the Holy Spirit to comfort us, to help us, and to be with us forever. Then in Acts chapter 1, the same Spirit is referred to as a gift from God, the one who will go with the disciples even to the very ends of the earth. We encountered this Spirit in the passage that Emily read for us just a few moments ago, in it, we learn that the disciples were all in one place when suddenly a wind came from heaven and filled the whole house, followed then by tongues of fire, which came to rest on every single one of them. Now, friends, I just have to ask, where else recently did we read about a wind or a cloud filling the entirety of a space? Sound familiar? And what other story, read maybe roughly like two weeks ago, <laughs> did we hear about fire representing the presence of God coming to rest over a place? Is this sounding familiar to anyone? Are you catching on to God's plan here? We learn in this passage what has always been true before. When God blessed the tabernacle and later the temple with God's presence, God did so then with wind, cloud, and fire. And God does so now with each one of us. And friends, this marks the final chapter in God's homecoming and God's journey to be with us. No longer does the Spirit of God have to make a home in some temporal fixed building, but thanks to the life, work, and sacrifice of Christ, the Spirit of God can now come to rest on each one of us as well. I really do love this passage from Acts, and it's really one of my favorites. And one of the reasons why I love it so much is because at the end of verse 12, we read the disciples and the crowd are amazed. They're perplexed over what they have just witnessed. And I think we can imagine them, can't we? Kind of standing there a little, a little stunned with their eyes like wide like saucers, like looking around at each other and asking, so... What does this mean? What does this mean? What does it mean that the Spirit of God now rests with Christ's followers? We find the answer to that question in our second reading from Ephesians. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Friends, what does it mean that God's spirit now rests upon us? It means that we, we are the new temple. We are now the permanent resting place for God. Each person, a stone or a brick, united by Christ and brought together by the Holy Spirit. Together we are an active and living, ever-changing, ever-growing, ever-learning new temple that reflects God's power and majesty, love and presence, not only to one another, but to the entire world as well. It's now that we can see the plan that God has been slowly unfolding from the very beginning. The movement from the tabernacle to the temple, to the savior and to the spirit all occurred so that God could make God's final resting place 
that final ultimate home with us. But friends, along the way, while we've learned so much about this home of God, I think we've also learned a lot about what it means to make our home with God as well. Remember my Credo friend that I mentioned just a few minutes ago? Well, I want to emphasize that not only did that friendly hiker bring her back to camp, but that hiker walked with her the entire way from the base of camp to our dining hall and didn't leave her side until she was reunited with her friends and family in Christ at the table where we were waiting to eat. Friends, I've heard it said before that the heart of a home is a table, a place of equity and peace, a place where we are seen, heard, and of course, nourished. God invites us to make a home with him, to allow ourselves to be guided by the spirit to God's table, to sit among siblings, sisters, and brothers, and to enjoy all that God has already prepared for us. We make our home with God every time we gather as a community of faith. Every time our buildings and grounds crew gather around the table at Stella's for lunch, when our women's Bible studies gather around tables to share testimony and truth, when our Sunday school children gather around tables to color, when our bell choir gathers around tables to practice and play, when our prayer shawl ministry gather around tables to craft, when our mission team gathers around tables with our partners in Malawi, Kalina, Second Mile, Hope Clinic, Crossroads, Fort Street, Youth Haven, and First Step. When we gather around each other's tables simply to catch up or to offer some much needed care. When our committees, elders, and deacons gather around tables to discern. And when we gather in worship around our communion tables to celebrate all that God has first done for us. Friends, whether the tables that we share are physical or virtual, large or small, high top or maybe a booth, it doesn't matter. Because in each one of these moments, as we are gathered into the presence of God, we are welcomed home as well. But friends, I have to ask, what happens when it becomes hard for us to gather? When life is increasingly digital or busy or challenging? What do we do when God is calling us to build this new temple with people we disagree with, with those we don't know, or perhaps with those we just don't like? How is the Spirit calling us to be a home for God here in this community of Plymouth? Well, for those answers, and surely probably a couple of more, I'm going to invite you around the table to join me and Emily and all of our staff and leadership around the table, in my case, hopefully one with coffee, as we continue to dream together, as we continue to listen to the Spirit and discern exactly where God is calling us to next. But friends, for today, let us be thankful. Let us give thanks to our God who, through the power of the Holy Spirit, chooses to dwell with us even today. And let us praise the God who invites us to make our home around God's table so that we might be together with God forever. Amen and amen. Friends, as we make the transition from sermon to table, I invite you to watch now this video that reminds us of the beauty of World Communion Sunday. Este é o meu corpo que é dado por vós. Fazer isto em memória de mim. Semelhantemente, depois da ceia, tomou o cálice, dizendo, Este é o cálice, é o novo pacto em meu sangue, que é derramado por ti. Bebei em memória de mim. Este é o leib Christi que é dado por vós. Ito ang aking katawan na ibinigay para sa inyo. Ikaw o para Kristi. Kore wa anata gata no tamini nagasareta Kristo sama no chi desu. 
Esta es la sangre de Cristo derramada por ti. Ang sarong ito ay ang bagong tipan ng aking dugo na ibinuhos para sa inyo. Bebe, you invited me. Faites ceci en mémoire de moi. Friends, today as we gather around this table, we do indeed remember that we are not the only ones invited, that God invites all, and that today and many other days, people in different languages with different customs celebrate this beautiful service of remembrance of all that Christ has done for us. Together, we proclaim that Christ's table is indeed wide and that Christ welcomes us all. Friends, remember that Jesus dined with sinners and with saints, with farmhands and with foreigners, with disciples and doubters, with children and cherished friends, with the outcast and the outspoken, with lepers and loved ones. And just as he ate at others' table, when Christ set his banquet table, He welcomed all of us as well. As we gather now around Christ's table, we are united with all of God's beloved across the whole of this earth. Through the love and grace made known to us in the breaking of the bread and the passing of the cup. So come to the table, come and witness all that Christ has done for you. Would you all please join me in prayer? Let us pray. Loving God, on this World Communion Sunday, we remember that this communion table and the elements we receive from it are not our own, but belong to you. You offer them freely to your children throughout the world everywhere, regardless of their race, gender, age, ability, or circumstance. We are privileged today to be among your children claimed by your grace. We pray today for anyone who finds themselves in need, for those who struggle in the aftermath of Hurricane Ian, for those without electricity, without roofs, without water, without loved ones, without obvious help on the way, We pray, dear God, that you would be their help, their peace, and their hope. Please bring healing and comfort to all who grieve and to all who are fearful about the future. For those men and women and agencies who, in the face of life's storm, race in to help, please be their source of strength, their wisdom, their guidance, their peace. We pray today, Lord, for your children in need around the world of every age, for those who battle illness, for those who battle loneliness, for those who cry out in grief, in pain, in doubt, or frustration. Lord, please bring the presence of your Holy Spirit to work within us, and to work through us. We thank you, dear God, that in the whole of life you do not leave us alone, but you have given us a Savior, your Spirit, your Word, all of which point us to that dwelling place that you have for us here within our hearts now and within your heavenly kingdom. Help us, dear God, to focus our lives on your spirit. Help us to be open to the promptings of your spirit. Guide us, we pray, with every day, with every breath, to grow in grace and share the love that we have first received from you. Gather these, our prayers, as well as any personal prayers which we lift up to you this day from our hearts. Gather these in the prayer of your Son, who has taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Friends, on the night that our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks to his Father in heaven for it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink from it, do so remembering me. For as often as you eat this bread or drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Friends, today here in the upper room, we are mindful continuously of different health requirements. And so rather than you coming forward to receive communion, we are asking our ushers to bring communion out to you. So if you stay where you are, you will be offered both bread and cup and know that together these are here for you. Let us come forward and share communion in this way.
Friends, let us pray. Living Christ, by the power of your spirit, you open the scriptures to us. You make yourself known in the breaking of the bread. Let us now go forth from this place, fed at your table, aware aware evermore of your presence, filled up and ready to walk with you all the days of our lives and proclaim the glory of your resurrection to all the world. Amen. Amen. Friends, let us join with Chris and Kylie in singing our final song for today. Would you join me? Would you stand, please? Every song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
comfort. Let us have trust. Let us build our lives upon the truth that we have a spirit of God that is always with us, that is always present, that always sees us and always hears us. Let us know that our God dwells with us and we are invited to make our home with God as well. And friends, as you go from this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. 